person here, both online. Uh, my name is John Colgan. I'm the chief executive of the Land Development Agency uh, in Ireland. And uh, welcome everyone to this, uh, the latest session in the fourth in the series of talks entitled uh, Talking About Land. Uh, it's a series that's organized between the Housing Agency, the Land Development Agency, and the Geary Institute for Public Policy, UCD. So just a reminder, it's a, it's a series of short online seminars and it examines how governments in other countries intervene in land markets to ensure that there's adequate affordable housing supply. Um, so we've had three really interesting sessions to date, um, including a high level overview of policy interventions on land and both here and abroad, uh, and more detailed sessions on public land banking uh, as well, uh, two uh, areas that are very uh, appropriate uh, to, to the land development agency and the work that we do. So the latest session that we have is about land readjustment, which uh, to my non-expert mind, I have to admit, uh, is about coming up with the best plan to ensure the coherent development of an area uh, without the constraints of land ownership, uh, to potentially reallocate land ownership where it makes sense and value uh, in a manner that doesn't disproportionately affect any one owner, but significantly enhances the deliverability of the overall area. So I hope uh, with our two expert speakers that they at least agree with some of that. Uh, and indeed, it's a concept that we've been thinking uh, for quite a long time, in fact, since the outset of the land development agency in 2018, as there are many large scale complex areas that comprise both state and private land, which may need readjustment and intervention to ensure uh, their delivery in a coherent and planned way, regardless of who owns the plots. So if you can imagine uh, the complexity that would be removed uh, if you could readjust land uh, by drawing a red line around the defined area, working out what should go where based on the plan that's most appropriate for its development rather than who owns the land. So I think that makes a lot of sense to everyone, but obviously that's a very simple thing. But this is part of the vision of the LDA itself. Uh, uh, in the context of it being what's called a delivery agency for the likes of what we already have, strategic development zones, but also the forthcoming urban development zones that's in the pipeline uh, from a policy perspective with the government at the moment that we're keeping a, a very close eye on. So I'm really fascinated to be involved in this session today uh, and to explore the potential more and to learn uh, from successes overseas. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers. Uh, the first speaker that we have is, is Ben Davey, uh, is the former chair of land policy, land management, and municipal geo information at the School of Spatial Planning at TU Dortmund University. Presently, Ben is visiting professor at the Faculty of Law, of Law at the University of Johannesburg, and is in fact joining us from Johannesburg today, which we're, we're delighted. I think Ben, at the time difference should be okay. So we had someone come from, from Australia in one of our previous uh, talks. So uh, so we're, we're lucky that we're broadly on the same time zone. Uh, he was the president uh, of the International Academic Association on Planning, Law and Property Rights, as well as the president of the Association of European Schools of Planning. Uh, ben has published uh, on property theory, planning law, land policy, a political philosophy of land. Currently, he is working on a comparison of land reform and expropriation without compensation in Germany and South Africa. So pretty qualified for the discussion that we're going to have today, I would say, Ben, as is uh, our own uh, Dermot Lawson. So when we think about land readjustment, we think about large scale strategic areas, which is a core part of the business of the federal agency. Dermot leads. Uh, that side of the land development agency. So she's the head of strategic planning in the LDA. Uh, she uh, leads the LDA's planning, public policy, uh, public lands and sustainability function, uh, works with partners to optimize, optimize state land usage, uh, no easy task, uh, and builds the pipeline for the LDA to develop lands uh, and to regenerate and deliver sustainable development, of, uh, particularly on these large areas. Prior to her current role, Derva worked in public and private sector roles, most recently as Director of Services in the New York Down County Council, and before this, Head of Transport and Strategic Planning in Cambridgeshire. So we're obviously very lucky to have some of my firm on our squad to drive this part of our business as well. Um, so we're going to hear from uh, both speakers. Uh, in first, uh, it's going to be Ben, then Derva, they'll talk for about 15 minutes each. Then we're going to have a Q&A. And if anyone here, just because of sound issues, uh, has questions, if you speak loudly when you raise them, 
Uh, and uh, we'll also be able to take Q&A from uh, online audience, which I'm pleased to see is from the very broad range, be it from government departments, uh, government agencies, uh, academics, and the private sector. So uh, we have all uh, on the table. So without further ado, I will introduce you to Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I hope you can hear me and I move forward. I'm right now uh, in Johannesburg with, with where, where there is the uh, end of, of spring and this beautiful hibiscus flower. I took that photograph a couple of, of days ago. Uh, that, that is something that probably uh, you cannot see right now in Germany or in Ireland. Length readjustment in Germany is a topic that I found quite fascinating. When I moved to Germany to Dortmund University from Vienna, uh, I really had to learn about the way length readjustment is done in Germany because in Austria we do not have that sort of uh, instrument to implement planning. Uh, the basic idea of German land readjustment is the implementation of a binding land use plan. What you can see on the left is the cadastral map showing the current property lines. And you see, if you can see my cursor, that there already has been some development going on, but in between probably the vestiges of some agrarian uses and the, the, the different landowners and their uh, properties are quite haphazard. And if you look at the binding land use plan, you see that the boundaries for designated building plots do not at all uh, fit with uh, the cadastral map. This is the message of the German planning system to planners. Don't mind the current property lines. Do your planning with a view to public interests, the public best, also private interests. And then once you've done the planning, there is an instrument to help you fit the property, the private property in land with the designated uh, building plots. And on the right in blue, you see the readjustment map, which is one of the final products of the readjustment process, showing the adjusted property lines. Land readjustment in Germany in five steps. Step one, commencement of land readjustment. The land readjustment authority defines the area selected for land readjustment with a view to recent land use planning. There is a close cooperation between the planning departments and the readjustment authorities. And if it becomes uh, clear that the next land use plan will need some readjustment, these two authorities will already work closely together and probably the land readjustment authority will uh, define the area as the land use plan has defined it, uh, but it's not necessarily so. The land readjustment authority then freezes all changes of the present land uses and all transfers of rights in the land. There is a suspension of land market activity during the land readjustment process. The land readjustment authority maps all properties and lists all land owners. And the land readjustment authority has the land register show that land readjustment has commenced. As you saw already with step one, and it will not change through the other steps, it's always about the Land Readjustment Authority. And that is the German system of mandatory land readjustment that really puts all the um, um, authority to act in the hands of the Land Readjustment Authority and the landowners they are uh, they they can uh, mention their needs, but from the perspective of the regulatory, um, system, they have very little influence. It's really a 
very administration focused uh, process. Step two, preparation of land readjustment. The land readjustment authority merges all properties into one bulk of land designated for readjustment. That's done, of course, only uh, virtually, not with a bulldozer. Uh, and then the readjustment authority assesses the present market value of the land. Um, this is a really important step because all uh, properties that are uh, thrown into the process are valued at uh, raw the, uh, the value, get the value of raw building land. And there is, of course, a difference between raw building land and mature building land. And readjustment is about achieving to get from the lower level of raw building land to the higher level of full mature uh, building land. The Land Readjustment Authority subtracts all land designated for public use, for example, local roads, and assigns the land to the municipality or development company. Uh, if I may briefly interrupt myself for an organization thing, some of you or maybe one of you still have their mic open, please mute yourself. Uh, then uh, the subtracting thing uh, is important because this is uh, what the public gets out of the process. Uh, the land used for public use, mostly it's the local roads, but there are other public uses too. It's part of the uh, readjustment process that this land is taken away from the mass, from the bulk of land designated for readjustment and assigned to the municipality or the development company. The Land Readjustment Authority selects a standard for the redistribution of readjusted land. And that standard can be according to the relative value or the relative size. And the authority determines the share of each individual owner. Step three, value capture and reallocation. The Land Readjustment Authority determines the value of the readjustment gain that owners have to pay to the municipality or that may be retained in land depending on whether the authority uses the standard of relative value or the standard of relative size. The Redmond Authority considers the present and proposed uses of the land, as well as the needs and suggestions of landowners. The Land Readjustment Authority allocates readjusted plots of land to each owner, and determines the readjustment fee that landowners have to pay to the municipality, but also the compensation of landowners who have not received their full share. The readjustment fee, if somebody puts in land into the readjustment process, they do not get land that is more valuable back and can keep that. They get back land that is more valuable, but they have to uh, pay the difference between the value of the land they put into the process and the value of the fully and mature building land. So in the end, the landowners do not get richer through land readjustment. What they get is land that can immediately be used for development. If someone only uh, has a little input into the bulk of readjusted land, <laughs> I'm sorry, they don't get anything from the process. They do not get a building plot out of the process but they will be compensated as if they were expropriated. 
Step four, the readjustment plan. The Land Readjustment Authority issues a formal decision on the readjustment of land. The authority determines the rights and obligations of each party, including the municipality. The Land Readjustment Authority includes a map of the new property boundaries and makes available legal remedies to all And step five, the implementation of the readjustment plan. The Land Readjustment Authority issues a public notice when, upon exhaustion of all legal remedies, the readjustment plan has become legally binding. The authority then files the readjustment plan with the land register and monitors the legal and actual implementation of the readjustment plan. So after step five is completed, the previous distribution of properties is replaced by the adjusted distribution of private properties and the land is now ready for development. Maybe in conclusion, a small reflection what makes land readjustment a successful tool land readjustment can be successful and what i'm telling you now is very much the german perspective and i would be very interested during question period to hear from you how you think that instrument would uh, work in the irish context Land readjustment can be successful if all stakeholders understand that no development will occur at all and the full land value of mature building land will remain dormant unless the property lines conform with the designated building plots. Land readjustment can be successful if landowners accept and trust the land readjustment authority. And that is something that I've experienced over 20 years in Germany as a, uh, actually, even as a miracle. If I, if I look at other countries, the United States, for example, it would be impossible in Massachusetts or in, in uh, California to do that because people simply do not trust the government. Uh, and they would never <laughs> allow the government to take away their land in order to readjust it in the public best, a really devious uh, idea for Americans, I think. Uh, but in Germany, this is something that works very well, actually. The land readjustment can be successful if the land readjustment authority can rely on the accuracy of the land cadaster and the appraisal of land values. So right now I'm in South Africa, but I've also done work in, in India um, and other uh, parts of uh, the global south. Very often there is no way that you have an accurate land cadaster. And then, of course, land readjustment does not really work because the prerequisite is missing. And land readjustment can be successful if, if the formal procedure of mandatory land readjustment is preceded by long and trust building informal talks. So very often what happens in practice in Germany is that uh, before the mandatory land readjustment process is launched, there is a often months long, sometimes year long, um, tentative debate between someone from the authority and landowners and maybe people are meeting tentatively, of course, very tentatively, and try to find out what would be the best way uh, to implement uh, the land use plan, because usually everybody is quite keen um, to receive uh, finally uh, plots of land that can be actually used for development. And uh, during that informal talk, a solution may emerge and only then the mandatory land readjustment process starts and that is a great advantage of the for the uh, landowners because uh, the acquisition of land 
through a formal land readjustment process is tax free. And I've written twice about land readjustment in Germany in English. And uh, these are the two sources. And if you want to have the 2007 thing, uh, just uh, write an email to me. I will gladly give that to you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, pretty interesting stuff and uh, a lot of food for thought in the Irish context. I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions around this, but I can immediately imagine the legal battles and disagreements about valuations and all sorts of stuff uh, that would arise in the Irish context. So I'd be very interested to discuss with you uh, in practice uh, how long these uh, processes take and their effectiveness and their success and so on, because uh, uh, sounds great, uh, but uh, just some of those aspects about agreements around land values and things like that would be would be a big, a big uh, issue, I guess, in the Irish context, I can imagine. Um, but talking about the Irish context, uh, we have Dermot Lawson now who's going to speak Firstly, about the, the broader context of Ireland, but then secondly, in relation to some aspects of the work that the Land Development Agency does in the space as well, and perhaps uh, opportunities in the, into the future which might be touched on that uh, these types of policies and arrangements could work in the Irish. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, and thank you to Professor Bailey there. We're very pleased to join you this afternoon. Um, to respond. So it, it's great to be learning terms of the international experience. I'm playing teacher here, so I'm not used to being a teacher, so bear with me. But I'm going to talk to the agenda here um, really um, to respond to the land pooling readjustment and um, talk a little bit about the Irish context, then why the LDA and our role of remit in addressing some of those challenges and look into the future and what's needed. So all in all um, Q&A. In terms of the, the land pooling and readjustment, I think it makes a very logical, practical, pragmatic approach to, you know, particularly in terms of infill or where you're looking at urban extension, the real opportunity there for that pragmatic, responsive uh, approach to be taken. I'd be very interested in understanding how long um, ben talks about lengthy, the, um, the lengthy and trust and discussions ongoing. I'd love to see and understand the interaction between planning department and indeed the land readjustment authority and, and how that how that that creative tension works. So so look, um, so I think there's real benefits to be secured without substantial capital outlay. I think that's a particular issue there that. You know, you've got a group of like-minded people working together for a common aim, and it looks like a practical approach that would enable that land to be brought forward for development. I also like about it that we start to build trust in the process. Um, there's transparency, but there's also that collaborative approach. So recognizing that the land will lay dormant unless it is brought forward for development and that there is consensus building. So, you know, some of the questions I'd have around you know, the time taking, how, how you take that, how you work together on that. But I think particularly around, you know, starting out with that hodgepodge and ending up with, you know, a good plan, a binding plan. There's a lot of sense in that. And I think one of the things in Ireland we're always interested in is growth frontage. And you can see there, you'll, you'll be certain that you'll get your access and services delivered. So I think a lot of, a lot of benefits in that. So in terms of the Irish context, then, we don't have a, a legislative background for land pooling and readjustment in Ireland. Um, uh, you know, the, the constitution very clearly protects the rights of the individual, but also recognises that that needs to be regulated by the principles of social justice and common good. And there's been lengthy debates down the years about how do we capture the benefit in the public interest. And that, that is an issue that is an ongoing debate. We had a very um, a very interesting Kenny report back in 1973, back before a lot of you were born. And that still is the basis for which we're discussing today planning reforms that are proposed through a new bill that the Department of Housing are looking at um, taking forward 
and, and they're consulting on. But that was talking about how do you make sure those decisions that are made by a public body in the public interest, either to invest or to zone land, that some of the value of that is better captured in the public interest. And it was back into delivering on the services or infrastructure that's needed. So, you know, currently what we see is a very significant focus around competition for land acquisition and land hoarding rather than focus on the output and outcome. And that has really, you know, that's really been an issue for us down the years. And we've seen that in that excellent report that was produced by um, the National Economic and Social Council back in 2018, which talked about Ireland's broken system and fixing that, you know, that the availability of land for housing in appropriate locations in a way that's consistent with affordability has long unresolved policy issue in Ireland. And land policy is really influential and effective in terms of promoting supporting affordable housing. That's what we have to get to deal with because we have to look at what the purpose of this land adjustment is. It is about delivering outcomes and affordable housing for people. So that lack of access to affordable land, big issue. There was a report done by the of Chartered Affairs in Ireland back in 20, 2019, talked about the um, cost of I mean, this is where this is where we, we do things you know, today and looking at our role in terms of optimizing and identifying public land that could contribute to more affordable housing. And in terms of the planning context, again, that is very much um, focused around, you know, delivering in terms of public interest. And um, we've had a lot of reforms in recent years, and we have our national planning framework, now, which is very much about trying to make sure that um, the needs are provided for with appropriate zoned land. Because back to the early 2000s, Dormans had doubled the amount of zoned land that was needed in the country and not necessarily in the right location. So this is much more of a focus now on compact urban development and regeneration. In fact, 40% needs to be towards infill and regeneration. So, so, so there's, a, there's a good context there. And you know, Ireland is a much more urbanized country now than and of 70% in urban areas. So it's about optimizing the nature and making the best use of the service facilities that we have and the vitality and viability of our towns and city centers as well. Strategic development zones in, in an effort to try and make sure that there's a pipeline going forward and the strategic zones are meant to be a fast track process for enabling development to, to come forward. They've been zoned since like, the early 2000s, but there have been issues particularly around you know, the time taken and particularly related to complexity around infrastructure, so the, the uncertainty around how much it's going to cost to deliver. Those, those, those spots are unknown up front. Institute of agencies involved with delivery infrastructure. So what ended up is that there's been a number of government programs, whether it's um, local infrastructure activation, or site funds, urban regeneration funding. So there's a myriad of funding, but also there's a type of betterment forward as well. So, so we don't necessarily have the land um, pooling and readjustment. We do have betterment in terms of Know, capital costs, so there'll be a, um, a tax on land that's sold on the uplift, but there will also be planning conditions and development contribution that are contributing to um, both the infrastructure and affordable housing. So part five of the, of the Act also requires that up to 20% of the housing is social and affordable housing. It used to be 10%, but we recognize there's a significant need for more social and affordable housing. So that, that need is growing. The government have put in place policies and programs, housing for all, to activate and to prioritize housing delivery in the in interest. So that comes on to why, why we're doing this and why the LDA, we talked about the housing market and the chronic shortage of our supply and that affordability is a key concern. But the need for the state to address you know, the, the disease in a sense, rather than symptoms and smooth the peak troughs through the through the um the housing market. And you know, we need to address that. And one of our most effective tools is um, and and that is what the LDA has been set up to deliver with a priority focus around the gland and making sure we use that line. A lot of our land is made up of bodies, by the 
health services and community services, infrastructure, and a good deal of opportunity. Location really is an opportunity you know, to look at those lands and identify how to probably spend on land that could be better used, particularly to allow our towns and cities to evolve and grow over time. So one of the things we're doing there is around um, a register of relevant public land. So that's looking at all of the towns and cities over 10 houses in Ireland to identify where it's relevant and it might be better used for affordable housing. So we're doing that audit of all of the lands at the moment and producing registers that will be available on our website very, very soon. And importantly, government was brought forward through the LDA Act 2021 um, part nine, where there's an affordability requirement that will apply um, to development. Um, that only is triggered when there's a planning application for five or more homes um, on the land, on the relevant public land, and 10,000. That will require a certain amount of land for social and affordable housing. The Dublin report, affordable housing, and social approach. The LDA will deliver that in cost rental largely and large scale long term and delivery of affordable housing and um, to give that security of tenure to people. That, that's it, that's what we're trying to do here. And for, for, for that, to build in that affordability, what's our purpose? Trying to build affordable housing. So securing state land and nominal land that can be used as a catalyst to drive the potential and to live with affordable housing in its future. That is a critical issue for us. So in terms of how we use that, then we use that to assemble um, uh, plans for large areas in Ireland, city, work across Falk, Limerick, Galway, Waterford, all of these places um, to try and deliver on the master plans so we can get the agenda of term working with the local authorities, but identifying the very a lot of them will involve relocating uses to enable those land having a pipeline so that you can move and move the piece of jigsaw to enable that vitality to critical mass in the city that will make a big difference. So that is that is part of the picture of building that making sure we can identify into the future. So lastly, then looking forward. So what's needed and potential opportunities. So I do think there is something about planning into the long term. Ben talked about where there's a long and trust discussion. You have to start somewhere. And sometimes what you need to do is start with a big picture idea, start with the possibilities and the ideas and the vision for how you can transform places. I think that's something that the LTA is, is doing a lot of this. We can all see the challenges. But we actually need a framework that will enable us over 10, 20, 30 years to be able to transform these locations, work to identify the infrastructure. Because if we are going to deliver in a much more integrated way and think about systems integration, lower carbon, carbon, climate, resilience, managing the trips, all of those energy provisions, these are of scale and potential through these plans. That's what we're, we're seeking to do and deliver, working with the, with the development plans and local authority areas as well. So that is very important. We see this as going beyond the, the one, two, three development plan periods in a lot of these places, but also we will have the delivery channel as well. So they will start to drop out the phases. But there are there are legislation and policy initiatives on the horizon as well. So we're watching those with great interest, and um, particularly around active land management. And I think. Importantly, it's going to be critical that we have the resources and powers to drive delivery of urban development and regeneration. We look at the complexity and potential. So the development agents role is important, but also in terms of how we capture that value that's created and, and enable us to think about the long term because there's wider socioeconomic impact that are created through these plans. Sometimes we're looking right now, here and now, about between the current the market value that's created, but it's into the long term, what does that do and deliver? So we need that plan-led approach and um, the Department of Housing are looking at urban development zones but, and, and to use um, infrastructure-led, development appraisal-led, so better understand viabilities up front. I think that's a good thing. And um, there's also the land value sharing mechanism 
mechanism that they're proposing so early days in the bill and to capture some of the additional value created by public vision and, and investment share with the state. So the big proposals there, we're looking forward to understanding more of the details and you know, the implications of this. For example, how will that work with part five, understanding how you get the balance right in the public interest as well, with it enables the viability and it's attractive to come forward as well. So I understand that the Department are doing economic appraisal on that at home. So that will help to determine um, in the end. But I do think you know that that whole role of coordination, certainty over funding for priorities, that is critical because when you have these SEZs, SEZs, that certainty and what funding will be available, how will the land value sharing and our developer contributions support the delivery of the objective the outcome in the future? Because back to our current this is about delivering and enabling land to support affordable housing and time in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Derva. I think that sets the scene uh, very well and it's a very good response to um, the Ben's uh, examples of the characteristics of land readjustment that have been successful in jurisdictions that he has uh, worked in, studied. Um, so we, we have time for about 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A and um, we have some online responses. I have some questions myself that have occurred uh, through the presentations. And of course, we have our audience here. So we've about, between online and in person, about 75 people. Um, and uh, so we have, as I mentioned, one or two questions that have come in from online. Perhaps I will uh, get into the Q&A by starting with our audience here uh, to see if there are any queries and uh, questions from the panelists. And if you do have them, if I could ask you to, again, speak uh, clearly just for our online audience, and I might repeat them for the benefit of that, just to ensure that Feel free. Observations or questions. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I suppose question really for uh, speakers from the LDA. Um, I, I suppose it's very interesting to hear about the experience of Germany and other countries about active land management. But um, I suppose there would be some history in Ireland of active land management, particularly in Dublin, in the Docklands in the 90s, 2000s. I wonder, would, would any, are there any examples from uh, what we've done before here that maybe for good reasons we might have uh, stopped doing, but perhaps there are parts of it that we be looking at again that might work well and that, that the LEA might be interested? So to, just for the online audience, uh, the, the question, very good one. Um, what about examples in Ireland where we successfully uh, planned larger scale areas? Uh, that might have aspects of, of what we've just discussed. Uh, perhaps, Derbla, you might have talked to that. I, I will indeed, and thank you for the question. Certainly, you can see, you mentioned the Docklands, well, that, that certainly has been transformed um, over time, and it was that kind of development which spoke with incentives as well that went with that, whether it's tax incentives like so. It, it's having the funding, having the powers, the decision, the plan, those are the kind of key ingredients that you need. So it's a dedicated team driving that with a binding plan, a bit like they have in Germany, that control over the land. So, so certainly that one, Fringe Gorman is another one. Well, I think when you have um, state lands involved and that can act as a catalyst, um, certainly it makes a big difference. You can see the, the impact and, and the outcome for Grange Gorman there. You know, transformed that area. Temple Bar was an early one as well. I know that you know it's it's one of those, but actually that was one where they they had um, European funding. It was one of the first ones. I think they they brought in capital funding from Europe to help transform that area. It was a very downtrodden area previously, but it really did help to transform. So that there's plenty of good experience here, and um, Cherrywood as well, and um, in Dunleary Rat Down. You know, I know it's again, it's one of those that's taken time to come through, but the approach that the local authority there had was setting up a um, uh, development team focused on that, working with the developers. 
Um, they they also put in place the, the plan for the infrastructure first. So all of that's in place. We have that certainty and stability. Um, and and for parks, so it created it, it created the the you know the, the blueprint then for for progressing that. So certainly the the types of plans, binding plans, SDZs have been an important um you know factor in that. But I guess it's that rigidity. But the issue around equity of funding and uncertainty of funding, I think those are the kind of things that we need to learn. And recognise that it is going to take time to deliver on that. But how do you factor in the costs, you know, or the benefits over time? Really quantify those costs and think about, you know, this is this is what the value. Is. So plenty of opportunity. Indeed, you're correct, Irma. And and just so there are learnings, I, I think we we can say there are successes in in the Irish context, uh, but. You know, there are also some that could have worked better where I think land readjustment measures could work really well. So we've had successful what we call strategic development zones, defined areas with the planning scheme. But for everyone that has been a success, there are others that have not been a success. So if you look at the global financial crisis and some SDZs fell apart due to landowner insolvencies, uh, inability to get agreement on who pays for the roads or Will I allow the roads to come through my land and that sort of stuff? So I think some of the stuff that Ben spoke about uh, could really help us there. And just on that, Ben, I might bring you in, if that's okay, just to to where there are disagreements on, say, infrastructure rollout, have land readjustment methodologies been successful in resolving kind of posturing by individual landowners? And John, I'm afraid the sound is not very good. Could you please repeat your question? Yes, Ben. It's it's just has uh, land readjustment uh, methodologies have they been successful in overcoming disagreement amongst landowners in respect of infrastructure deployment? Thank you for the question. Yes, absolutely. Um, the the uh, I, I was very much surprised, as I said, uh, because I did not know that instrument from, from Austria uh, when I uh, came to Germany over 20 years ago and I learned about land readjustment uh, that in almost all cases, uh, the owners were quite eager uh, to have their land readjusted. They were, of course, also very eager to get as much out of the process as was possible. But it's uh, no question that the pacifying effect of mandatory land readjustment in most cases in Germany is quite remarkable. Having said that, I would like to add two uh, observations. The German legislator in, nine, in the 1950s, particularly with respect to the Socialist uh, Democratic Party, uh, was, and I'm talking about Western Germany here, please, um, was, was, was very eager to uh, make an end of this liberal concept of private property and uh, to capture all of the planning game. Uh, but as the uh, negotiations in Parliament proceeded, it became very clear uh, that the CDU, the uh, Christlich Soziale Demokratische Union, was not willing at all to, to allow that. And the compromise was a law that makes very clear that all the planning gain, every in, in increase of value, uh, that is induced by the land use plan goes to the owner, to the private landowner. And only the difference between um, raw building land and full mature building land is up for grabs if the land uh, readjustment authority is successful in readjusting uh, the land. So th this to me seemed as some unnecessary uh, acknowledgement of uh, private property. I, I, I thought that uh, it could be much more aggressive. But then I learned from a number of colleagues in, in practice how important it was 
to uh, confine the influence of the government to this very small increase of land value. That I think is a really important aspect. And two, land readjustment does not work. And there was a case in front of the federal constitutional court to that effect, if somebody buys strategically land in order to prevent development because they want to be left alone. If their properties are put into a readjustment process, to them, the purpose of private property to be left let alone uh, is defied. And, and therefore, they will uh, resist. And uh, that was a case where the federal constitutional court had to decide whether land readjustment was in the constitutional sense expropriation of, of private property. But apart from these cases of strategic land uh, purchases, I think that the effect of land readjustment in Germany is a very peaceful and tranquil uh, because the authorities never appear to be greedy. Thank you. Can, can I ask as well? I'm, I'm, I, I see this as being very effective with urban infill and extensions, but I wanted to check with you then. You know, it'd be, it'd be good to know more about the timing that it takes to come forward. You know, the, the, the lengthy and trusted discussions you talked about. But how about, um, you know, where you're talking about a larger scale development? Is this where you have your omligum? I, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right, but. But is that is that a similar process that you go through in Germany around the readjustment for larger scale areas, or is there a particular scale that the, the adjustment applies to? I thank you for this question. I've heard about two types of development. One where the developer uh, buys all of the land before they start even to discuss with the planning authority. So then there's one owner with 10 hectares of land approaching the planning authority saying, okay, I own that land, I want to develop a shopping center, please, I would like to have planning permission. And the other case, uh, I would say the 10 hectares is about right, what, what, what I've been experiencing um, in, 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 in these cases, I think that uh, the uh, mo mo most of the time, um, the, the land readjustment is just an important step in the development process. Does that respond to your question? Yes, it does. And, and just a little bit on the timing it takes, you know, just to, just to go through steps one to five, what's your typical Time. I would say that with this typical 10 hectare development, the planning takes about uh, two years and the uh, readjustment another year. But since 1998, the readjustment uh, is allowed to run parallel to the planning process. So that even makes it a bit uh, shorter. And if it if if there is a landowner or if there are landowners who really are uh, insisting on something that nobody else can accept, it will take much much longer. Thanks, Ben. Um, we might take some more questions from from the uh, in person audience. Oh, no? thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, a couple of questions for Ben. Um, what type of entity is the Land Readjustment Agency? Or is it part of local government or who appoints the, the people on it? And the okay, second question is, is it, does it pay for itself the, the, with the contributions from the landowners? Um, but does, but where does the initial, or, or do, does, does government put on the initial money to um, start to um, you know to initially do the infrastructure work? I'll just uh, summarise that just for the online audience. Um, the so first question is uh, who who is the typically the, the land readjustment authority? Is it the municipality or the local government? 
And then secondly, um, is there money paid up front by the government to pay for infrastructure that might be recovered later on from land uplift value? Thank you very much for this uh, question. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the Human Rights Convention, um, Article 6 of the Human Rights Convention uh, demands that uh, decisions on civil rights must be made by a tribunal. And for uh, over 20 years, I've wondered whether the German land readjustment authorities meet that criteria if they are a tribunal in the sense of Article 6. Uh, they are uh, authorities uh, of the state. They are not municipal authorities. Uh, they are uh, established for each city or for each county, but they are not part of the uh, local self-government, the municipality. Uh, the municipality, in fact, is a party in the land readjustment process, like, like every other uh, stakeholder there. I, th there never was an attempt, as far as I can uh, say, uh, to uh, ask the European Court of Human Rights about the tribunal quality of the land readjustment authorities, as has been done with uh, the Grundverkehr in, in Austria. There, uh, I have no idea how to translate Grundverkehr, uh, that you need a permission to acquire land. Um, and uh, there, there were several cases where uh, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, said, no, the uh, authorities in, in Austria are not tribunals. Uh, the members of the Land Readjustment Authority uh, are uh, independent. They uh, are not receiving any directions from a superior uh, authority. When it comes to the servicing of the land, uh, this is done by the municipality and the municipality is allowed to recover up to 90% of the servicing cost. And yes, this is upfronted by the uh, municipality, uh, which in some cases creates really very peculiar uh, problems for municipal budgeting. Uh, over the past two years, there's been a debate in, in North Rhine-Westphalia um, that uh, actually the government should, should pay for roads and, and similar um, um, public uh, amenities. But uh, the, the, the basic rule is that this is uh, done by the municipality and the municipality is allowed to recover up to 90% of the costs. The uh, costs of the process and the cost of who, who pays the member of the Land Readjustment Authority, um, this is an honorary job for many of the members. And so, for example, my uh, predecessor, uh, a professor, was member of the Dortmund uh, Land Readjustment Authority, and he did not receive any income from, from, from that. And uh, some of them are part of the uh, civil service and, and get their uh, salary through uh, the civil service. But there is, it, it, it's not the case that the process of land readjustment has to pay for the process. Thank you. Interesting, Ben. And uh, uh, similarities, I guess, in some respects to ourselves with the margin, emerging up from delivery of infrastructure on large areas and recouping it partially, at least by way of development levies and other things. Um, and I guess what was also quite interesting was that the local authority or the municipality is not the land readjustment authority, which is quite interesting. Maybe a new role in the future for the valuations officer, such like uh, perhaps. Uh, I think we might take one more question, uh, if that's okay, and we will try and wrap it up then in the next few minutes. Question. I got a sort of a two-part question. Uh, around just around the readjustment in the in ours. 
So there's a very uh, clear tension between property ownership and you know adjustments by an authority. How do you uh, um, offer the, the carrot of enhancement, as you were saying, John, at the start? Uh, and then also maybe disincentivize dis uh, or hoarding. Is there a land valuation taxation measure which would encourage people to move towards adjustment and see the enhancement that they would benefit there? How would we, how would we deliver it in a large context? I might just initially respond to that and perhaps uh, bring in in Durbla, but but I think you're right. Like I mean, the term carrots and sticks. Whenever this discussion is had, uh, in terms of how, sorry again for the online audience, uh, how do you both incentivize the correct behaviors and disincentivize the undesirable behaviors in relation to land uh, readjustment? And we, we have elements of that uh, vacant site levies due, due to be replaced by the the land value tax uh and uh but but also uh incentives uh, on the other side as well um derva do you want to to, to talk to any of that can indeed yes i i do think there, there is something because you know we we've seen that that tension between land hoarding and retaining that value or or kind of speculating to maintain the value as opposed to bringing it forward and there is something about making sure that where land is zoned and serviced, it really ought to be coming forward, you know, because particularly when there's a need for that properly, properly in place. So, so I know that um, there's there's proposals in the new bill for that, or um, sorry, and we're bringing in the the, uh, the government are bringing in a residential zoned land tax as well. So that's they're looking at three percent of the value of the land. That is the annual cost that in the, in the coming few years. But I think with land value sharing, where we need to see the detail from that, we are talking about for newly zoned residential land that there may well be a cost and to that. But I think certainly, you know, getting land in, you know, that land spending needed so that you can understand that. But there, but there does have to be establishment. We need to understand the value of the body, things like the extent of viability and quality structure constraints or issues. We need that evidence base. And I think when you have an evidence base around what's a five year land supply may be looking like, where's the service land? Have we got a sequential approach to unlocking those? And if things are not moving forward, there are services zoned and ready to go, then, then I do think there is a need to, do, to kind of use the use the stick as well as the carrot. Okay, uh, thanks, Durba. Well, well put. Stick and carrot. I guess you could sum up uh, land readjustment uh, in in that short term. But uh, thank you very much to our uh, in person audience and our online audience. Uh, again, great numbers coming through uh, on this series. Special thanks uh, to our speakers today, uh, Professor Ben Davy, all the way from Johannesburg. Uh, we're honoured to have you, uh, Ben, and thanks for speaking with us. We we really learned a lot and also from our own Durbland Awesome here from the LDA. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks again to the Housing Agency and the Geary Institute. Um, and just to mention that this is the last session in the Talking About Land series before Christmas. Uh, there are three more though in 2023. Uh, the next is on Tuesday, the 10th of January, when you'll be really refreshed after the Christmas break. Uh, and that will talk about land value capture. So maybe we can finish your question uh, and the response to it back then. And session six after that will be land uh, land value tax. And then session seven is on the topic of inclusion rezoning. And you can get more details on the housing agency website. So thank you all.